everybody and welcome back this is jeff jones and with me today again is jack welcome back jack nice to see you thank you very much good to be here hello everyone hope you enjoyed and today's today's broadcast of go ahead jeff outcry yeah outcry so we're going to be talking about a documentary that first aired um in show on showtime you haven't watched them yet and you want to go back and watch them we're going to just talk, try to talk about episode one through three. We'll probably, we're trying not to spoil it too much. And we're going to leave episode four and five for next week. I had to look up the term outcry just to give everybody a little bit of a content warning. This documentary deals with a uh, child SA. If you're squeamish or if it's something that's not for you, maybe, uh, maybe you want to skip this one and come back when we talk about murder. This this documentary was tough for me because of the content. And I want to give you a little bit of overview about it. So this documentary outcry is very aptly titled. There is an outcry from a four-year-old child who said that there was SA that, that was committed against him. We find out in episode one that the finger has been pointed towards a Greg Kelly, who was a high school football star. And this is all taking place in uh, Texas. Uh, And so, as you know, Williamson County, Texas, football is life in a lot of places in the U.S. And that's no exception in Texas. Texas takes their high school football very seriously. A little background on Greg Kelly. He was, you know, he was playing at the senior level when he was a sophomore. Uh, It was pretty obvious that he was a standout in high school football. They talk about in episode one, uh, you know, about the promise of his career and how he was a likable guy and he was kind of a straight, straight edged guy. The outcry or the accusation made against him um, has to do with the fact that he lives in a house where there is a daycare center in the house. So one of the children that is being watched at the house made an outcry, basically had said Greg, had never said Greg Kelly. He didn't know, obviously he didn't know the last name. The boy had just turned four. We do see some of the footage in the beginning of episode one, the interview of the young child. I don't know if there is a, a working name that we can use other than four-year-old child. Yeah, for, for name, I think maybe we should just use outcry one and outcry two. Okay, two different children That work sure. for you? That's fine. But, because the second boy, I think, is six, but that's a whole other story. As Jeff said, Rick Kelly is a, really a standout kid. Uh, really mature for his age. And they get him pretty quickly. He's dating, I can't remember the girl's name, but he's got a pretty steady girlfriend. They're, she talked about how they'd met and, you know, so forth. And, you know, they became boyfriend and girlfriend. A little background about why Greg Kelly was living in this other house. His father and mother both had a serious uh, medical issues that happened roughly at the same time. In that county where the, or where they lived that he really needed to be in a place where he could continue to go to this high school that he was going to. That's what he wanted. Because he was you know, this star as a sophomore at the school. So another, uh, uh, this woman in the community that lived nearby uh, and certainly within reach of that high school offered the parents to let Greg come stay with them. And this lady, uh, she gave Greg a car, phone, you know, just made him feel completely at home. But there was definitely some ulterior motives with that because she understood what kind of kid this Greg Kelly was. He was a good kid. He just seemed like a good kid that had his path before him. And he was that what he was driving for was to play pro ball. And that's kind of where that, that, that goes. And then we get into, of course, the outcry. If you, if you don't really pay a little bit close attention, it can get a little confusing over some of the details. Some of the details are extremely important. But there's some salient details that occur that you don't know about until you get a bit more into late episode two into episode three about what people have done 
and not done uh, to let this kid go through what he did. It's absolutely horrific. It's terrible. A little review here in the Texas Monthly. You might have even sent this to me, um, but I'm yeah, just going to read it because I think it's really helpful. It's pretty concise. And so um, in 2013, Kelly's father was recovering from a stroke, which you had mentioned right. he had health problems. And his mother was undergoing treatment for a brain tumor. So brain that's, tumor. Yeah, that's what yeah. she had. Yeah. Gregory was a, a standout athlete at Leander High High School, um, you know, middle class school in Austin. He needed a place to live while his parents healed up. So he moved into the home of his best friend and football teammate, Jonathan McCarthy. Important yes. name to remember in this. Absolutely. McCarthy's mother, and this kind of steps into uh, what Jack has been itching to talk about. McCarthy's mother ran a daycare at the house. So just to recap clearly, Gregory, who was accused of the SA, um, the super, actually it's called super aggravated SA. He, because his parents were recovering from their health, health issues, he moved into his best friend's house, Jonathan McCarthy's house. His mom ran a daycare center there. That's where this supposedly had taken place. One of those, those children, a four-year-old boy, told his mother. Kelly was then arrested soon after another young boy made a claim. And he claims that he was also had an essay against him. Kelly was then charged with the super aggravated essay and uh, elevated charges that removes the possibility for parole. Um, and at one point in episode one or episode two, Greg Kelly himself talks about how these charges are actually stronger than a murder charge in some cases, because Absolutely. in murder, you can actually get parole. And in right. this one, there's no eligibility for parole. So um, it's no secret at, in the first three episodes that Greg Kelly is incarcerated at this point. That's not a uh, spoiler alert to anybody. Um, and he was convicted. He had to make that decision, right? Um, should I take yeah, the deal? Five, yeah, five minutes. And get, and get out. Yeah, well, he had like five minutes to make it, make his decision. <laughs> he basically take the deal and be locked up until you're 44 or chance it at trial. And Greg says he doesn't know, he couldn't make the decision. And he actually like deferred to his family to help yes. him make the decision. Yep. And I believe it was his mother who passionately said, 44 is not that old. You don't know what can happen. You don't know what a jury's going to think. I thought it was really a, a really... And I'm, I'm guessing, of course, in Texas, this is probably legal, but this was a conversation with the judge that the defense lawyer had. And for him to say to her, well, if he agrees not to appeal, sounds away his appeal rights, I'll give him this. But I, I, I don't like that at all. But, but I just find it really inappropriate and a threat. Yeah. Um, one detail that I can add in there, Jack, is that there was no physical evidence connecting any of this. Kelly was convicted basically on the words of a four-year-old. This brings into, you know, I think in episode three, they really dig deep, you know, jumping forward a little bit. They really dig deep and talk to psychologists about child stories and when children come forward and um, how much of a mixed bag it can be when a child makes claims that yes. sometimes they can be very accurate and sometimes they can be very inaccurate. You know, believe the children is a refrain that was happened throughout the show. We should believe the children. And it's, and that's, you know, that's appropriate in a lot of cases, but we also have to verify information because we don't want to lock up the wrong person. And sometimes, you know, four year olds can be confused um, maybe they, something was planted in their head to say, maybe something did happen, but not in those ways. So, um, it is unfortunate that the only evidence that was presented was, uh, you know, a story of, of a child who 
Um, almost no doubtedly something happened to him, but are we sure that it was Greg? You know, if you really get down to it, there was no real investigation. Now they did go and take some photos of the house. Thank God. They're, you know, they, they did talk about the DA's office uh, to some extent and uh, the goings on. Yeah. Just some various things that are really, really not good. You know, as, in, as the prosecutor. Now, the, the guy that uh, you see a lot in the documentary, he is the new uh, prosecutor, and I really like the guy. I, I really like him because he seemed like a really a no-nonsense kind of guy, uh, and he wants the truth. But getting back, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, getting back to this lack of investigation, th th these kids weren't even shown a lineup. They weren't yeah, even shown a photo. A positive ID would go a long way. Yes. That's right. Of, of, of not only Kelly, but anyone that lived in that house that these children could have contact with, right? Anyone. It right. doesn't matter if right. it's a, a family member or somebody visiting. That that needs to be done. To me, that needs to be done. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about there's two, you know, wrongful convictions. I'm going to talk about Michael Morton in a minute, but I wanted to kind of go back to where I left off talking about children who misunderstand what is happening or there's false claims. And so the article, and I'll share that in the link with you guys, it says that during the 80s, as a part of a satanic panic, that stoked uh, mostly unfounded fears of occultism and ritual violence in the U.S. There were a lot of false allegations of child abuse at daycare centers um, and sent a lot of people to prison. One of those cases took place in Austin, and that dealt with Fran and Dan Keller. Well, the Kellers spent 21 years in prison before their exoneration in 2013. Um, there were similar instances that happened in California, New Jersey, Massachusetts, the UK, Canada, and New Zealand. You have these two kind of competing spheres here. You have believe the children, and then you have the history of, you know, these allegations that were false. As, as a viewer of the documentary, you're thinking, well, is this kid tell, telling the truth or isn't he, right? It seems like he is, but as we know, there can be, you know false accusations. And I, I talked a little bit earlier about the psychologist that's mentioned, and I kind of just want to get that because it they addressed that in the article as well. They said that there was a deep dive into suggestibility research. So Kamala London, a forensic psychologist at the University of Toledo, um, she references a landmark study in which children under, underwent a routine medical exam. And initially, they told interviewers that nothing appropriate had happened. But after repeated interviews with suggestive questions, like, can you show me where the doctor touched your V? You know, not unlike those asked by the social workers in the, in the attorneys in the real investigation, the kids changed their, two, their stories a little bit and then started to insist that they had been abused. Oftentimes, they even elaborated in great detail. And so London and her colleagues found a similar pat pattern in the footage from uh, the Keller case and others in the 80s. Kids were denying it quite often, she says, but would be interviewed repeatedly. They would have gradually succumb to these really high pressure tactics. What does that sound like to you, Jack? Where have we heard this before? If you keep asking and you keep asking and you keep asking, eventually Brendan. they're going to give you what you want. Brendan. That's exactly Brendan right. Dassey, the uh, last uh, last week when we talked about the confessions, pretty much every false confession that you've ever heard, it's the same thing. Um, that's, that's what I took away from it. These yep. high-pressure tactics. You get what you want if you keep at it. Yeah, you know, they uh, these experts, you know, they 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 really kind of tell a story, and you know, intermingled with this, they're showing footage of this uh, interviewer. Uh, at, they call it the what do they call it? The CAC C C A C or yeah, I think it's the C A C. They call it those where they take children to for various reasons, but one reason is to interview them by these so-called uh, you know therapists or who are there to you know find out ask them questions about what happened, so forth and so on. It's really interesting that um, this second 
Accra victim, uh, he initially said nothing happened. After they made this announcement that, about Kelly, you know, they're talking to the parents and so forth and so on, I guess. But they had said in their news conference, you know, anybody that has any, you know, either children that stay in the daycare, you know, if you had a problem, you know, you need to contact us right away. Four days go by, there's not a single call, nothing. No one calls anyone. This detective decides on his own, he's going to call the father of this one child. But he tells this uh, dad, you know, your kid might have been assaulted. So we need to, we need to have an interview. This kid said nothing happened. Nothing happened. And then he eventually changes his story. But then when they get to trial, the kid recanted, said nothing happened at all. So what the hell is Daly doing here? He's the one that made the effort to call this parent. So you, you really begin to understand, hey, wait a minute. What are you doing? Why did you call this guy? They didn't call you. Their kid hadn't said anything. So you got to wonder why he called this particular parent. And we, we don't, to this day, don't know. And the other, you know, poor investigation techniques that were when, you know, when he first received the call from the parent saying that the child had reported an outcry, he didn't go to the McCarty daycare to investigate. Right. He didn't interview, he didn't interview the daycare employees or speak to the other young men living there. And apparently nope. there were men, there were young men on the football team in and out of there. I thought I heard as many as 20 people, you know, the whole football team was in and out of there. That's right. The very popular house uh, parts of the football team or a bunch of them would just come over and stay. That have a, it's like a, a meeting place for the entire team. Like you said earlier, they were, he was never shown a lineup, but in nope. the documentary, when we see a side-by-side photo of McCarty and Kelly, they're like twins. That's really where you get the sense that maybe this is, this is Jonathan McCarty. Maybe this did happen to this uh, outcry one, as we call him, the four-year-old. But maybe they got the wrong guy. Um, after it was all said and done, I guess I can jump just a little bit. And this uh, this guy gets, you know, basically the, uh, the a lot of people, you know, ramped up and pissed off about this conviction of Greg, Greg Keller because they're, you know, he's just like, there's just no way. What the hell is going on here? Uh, but eventually, this Keith Hampton, he's another attorney, he gets involved in, in the case. The things really start, the wheels really kind of start turning because he, he really starts asking some really tough questions. Um, it, it starts getting revealed some th- different things about Greg Kelly's uh, actual defense attorney and what she withheld um, and wh- why she did it. it because, you know, it, it, there were people that actually had reported not it wasn't just one person there were multiple people that went to this lawyer and said uh, you need to look at jonathan mccarty you, you've got to take a look at this guy and you got to look these guys side by side they look alike they, can they be look broke. alike and one of them has 16 arrests for other incidents and one of them has a clean record but yeah we you know mccart mccarty He's the one who'd been arrested multiple times, came up. The SpongeBob SquarePants pajamas were a big one where yes. um, the boy had said the man who did this wore these SpongeBob pajama pants. Friends and classmates had attested McCarty often wore them. Um, but then he had also denied it later on a, on a phone call. No, I never wore those. Ne- uh, no, never. Some other he details. Showed him, a, showed him a photo of him and them. Yeah, and then he said, oh, that. maybe I did. I don't remember that, but I guess I did. No, I never wore, yeah, that's right. I never wore these ever, never. And then show him a picture of him wearing them. We go, well, I don't remember that. I'm like, okay. So <laughs> there was also something really important about that. The documentary brings up a point that McCarty denies ever having anything to do with SpongeBob pants yeah. before it's revealed that it's an important detail. How did McCarty know... To, to distance himself from the pants unless he had known that that detail. That's right. And that really makes you kind of turn the table and go, wow, this McCarty guy, 
it seems like it seems like maybe he's he's the one that's right that's exactly right and you know getting a little bit more talking about the mccarty brothers and greg kelly's defense attorney she actually had greg kelly's defense attorney she had actually defended the three mccarty brothers in some fashion or another uh in previous cases but she didn't reveal any of that and then of course these people coming along and said you really need to look at jonathan mccarty in this case because uh number one they really look alike this kid could be confused and not know what the hell he's talking about and she's like even her own defense defense investigator she said we're not going that direction we're not going that way not doing that well wow. daly who mentioned earlier he's the investigator and when the defense asked him the per what's the purpose of a criminal case he answered successful prosecution not to find the truth and the, and apparently there were audible gasps in the courtroom which is what jack you and i are talking about all the time on this show and in previous shows in other podcasts that it's about getting a, a prosecution not about finding the truth all the time right and that's completely wrong it's about the truth if it's not about the truth then what's the point in even having the investigation you're done just go accuse whoever and arrest them and throw them in jail uh, the, all this have, the, that's another thing we, we we haven't covered yet when this guy took the case he got greg kelly's phone records and he proved that greg kelly was not in that house on july 12th he wasn't there he'd been gone for a week he was living somewhere else i guess back home or wherever in texas apparently the prosecution can just kind of make up a uh, some hypothetical date that an offense occurred. It doesn't have to be an exact thing. Mm -hmm. Kelly was arrested on the th this kid outcried on the 13th. So they figured it happened the day before. And it, so apparently the prosecution had found this out that Kelly wasn't there. So they moved the date back to April. Oh, they just Lord. moved it. They just moved it. And it's legal. Should it <laughs> be? It's legal. Should no. That's not the truth, right? That's trying to get a conviction, not following the truth. That's right. Before we get too far along and forget about it, it is the story about uh, Michael Morton. Michael Morton um, was wrongfully convicted also in the same community. So it says, after spending 25 years in prison for a murder of his wife, he was released in 2011 and officially exonerated in December of 2011. DNA evidence implicated another man who had also been tried to a similar Texas murder that occurred two years after the murder of his wife. This wrongful conviction was in the backdrop of people's minds. And so I think, you know, I may be wrong on this, but I feel like some of the reason why there was such a support for Greg yeah. was because of this wrongful conviction that had happened in the same jurisdiction. So um, and the prosecutor, just to add into that, the prosecutor at the time refused to test this DNA. He refused. He kept refusing. Until the court ordered him to, right? I, yeah, I don't remember exactly how that occurred, but they were finally forced to let, allow the DNA testing, which cleared the guy. Again, are we looking for the truth or are we looking for a conviction, Jack? That's right. That's right. Exactly and I right. think, you know, I think that's going to be the theme whenever we do a documentary about wrongful convictions. Um, it seems like that's the theme over and over and over again. We keep hearing that. They want to close the case. They want to get a conviction. Some people would might say they want to make a name for themselves. They want to move up the board. It, it's very troubling uh, because we see case after case after case uh, of the same thing. And, you know, you always have, a, uh, you know, you got to have the prosecutor that's willing. And then you got to have a, a, a detective, an officer, or a combination of a few that were willing to, you know, go this route or locked in. They're tunnel visioned and they don't look anywhere else because they, they're done. They're completely done. I mean, you, you know, I get it. You know, you got a four year old that's making the statement. I get it. You, you, but you have to investigate. You have to at least do some cursory investigation, which was not, again, it was not done at all. 
Not so what are your kid, but kids what are your thoughts on it. that? Why why do you think if I had to put you on the spot, the detective avoided it and the defense attorney avoided it? I don't know. I, I've tried to you know I, I remember back when I watched this originally back a few years ago and I I did some digging to try to make that connection and try to find out, but I, I got nothing and I. It's almost like that there was something going on in the background that we don't know about that I can't prove it. I, I don't know. Because she clearly, this defense attorney clearly had a conflict of interest. She should have never taken the case. And McCarty, it's revealed, I think in episode three, that he was he was convicted of, of SA, of another person. So he is in yeah. he is in jail. And in episode three, there is a phone call of his friend or he calls his friend and he's talking to his friend and his friend says hey man uh they went through your phone they found pictures of a little boy naked they found a lot of pictures a thousand over oh, right. well over i don't remember how many it was it was, a, it was over a thousand i know that considerable right and uh he brushes it off and he goes oh come on bro you know i wouldn't do that and he's like well why is it on there then he goes it's my nephew and he goes how does that make it better and his <laughs> friend is like how does that make it any difference if it's your nephew or not you know so that's kind of that's kind of where episode three kind of ends um not that we're done talking uh for this episode today but um, that we're kind of left on a cliffhanger there. There's one other part that I wanted to add before, just because it's coming up is that um, we get a little twist at the end of three and the SpongeBob pants come up again and they go through Kelly's phone. They go through his emails. They go through all of his, his digital stuff and they find out that he's also been on porno sites. He's accused, accused of being on adult friend finder which he yeah. denies adamantly. He goes, I was never on that. It's completely made up. It's a lie. Um, but it's also revealed that he had at one point also wore the SpongeBob pajamas. He admitted to it. Point. He admitted, he admitted to it. He, yeah. yeah. He said, I probably yeah. did. If something was dirty, I'd, and I, that was the only thing I had, I probably did. Right. Whereas He's the other kid was like, the other kid was like, I don't, I never even had that. That no, I, I, no, no, no. And then they find a picture of him wearing it. Obviously, he wore it more. Students at school had said that that he had wore it, that he had wore it more often than Kelly. You know, at the end of episode three, they're trying to bring in reasonable doubt here. You know, they're trying to say, no, no, no. You know, maybe we did get the right guy. Maybe they're both screwed up. Maybe you know they were best friends, by the way, um, which is a point that Greg Kelly says multiple times it's worse when it's your best friend. It is. Um, but I think it's also, you know, talking about getting in a little bit to episode. Um, I don't know if he's in episode two, but he's definitely in episode three is this Texas Ranger and what he did, which I, I thought was really, really inappropriate. Um, what he did because of the timing of it. You know, when he came in and revealed uh, that uh, revealed that uh, Kelly had allegedly been on, you know, adult friend finder and had gone on dates and all this, I think Jonathan had got his phone and had done that on his phone. That's what I think. I can't prove that, of course, but he. We do know that Kelly talks about he went to look for his phone. He couldn't find it, and he's looking all over the place for it. He eventually goes back up to his room and he phones on his charger. You know, Jonathan's telling him he didn't know where it's at. Maybe he left it downstairs or somewhere. I think I think Jonathan did it. That's right. He and that's that was a point where he kind of really understood that his quote unquote best friend was not really his best friend. Well, they do talk about this jealousy factor. When he first moves in, when Greg Kelly first moves in, everything's great. But he, he said several months, you know, after he's living there, um, you know, this retaliatory Jonathan changed he becomes really uh, disrespectful to his parents and everyone really he completely flipped because of this clearly jealousy factor because Greg was on the varsity team Jonathan was not he was relegated to the the B team or whatever you, they call it so there was a, a huge jealousy factor in between them 
And, you know, Greg didn't see it that way. He just wanted to be his friend. You, you brought up the Texas Ranger. That guy is Cody Mitchell. Kelly supporters initially thought that he was on their side. He even publicly, like, hugged Kelly's mother. He did. After he asked by uh, to review the case in 2017, he took the stand in August of that year as Kelly's lawyers tried to convince the judge that Kelly was wrongfully convicted to rip into the local police's investigation he too decided that Kelly's investigation was weak and that he said that Kelly was denied due process. He testified that the Cedar Park police fabricated the dates of the assault in order to turn Kelly into a better suspect. He yep. quoted, I would be scared to death if I could end up in the same position with no evidence whatsoever and no investigation done and be convicted of something I may or may not have done. Uh, he said that on the stand. However, during the hearing, Mitchell also stated that he believed Kelly couldn't have been ruled out as a suspect. Then later that month, filed court documents in which he called Kelly dishonest and evasive in them. He claimed Kelly had developed an unusual interest in porn around the same time the, <laughs> the SA claims. Yep. And Kelly's defense argued that, sure, Kelly did not look at the porn, but was more, but more deviant sites came from porn site cookies and were not his actual searches. We've heard this before, that when you open uh, certain sites, you get pop-ups or you get cookies that come up and they're yeah. like links to other more, maybe more hardcore sites. And so there is a little bit of ambiguity in there. Maybe he's just saying, I'm telling the full truth. And maybe that's how he sees it, that he's like, well, this is how I feel. I'm just gonna tell the truth. I don't know one way or the other. I guess I could give him the benefit of the doubt there, but it did seem to a lot of people like he flip-flopped. He, Yeah, it did come off that way to me. It really did. Plus, the, he didn't find any... I don't know this statement. He's saying that, you know, Kelly made this switch into this more hardcore porn kind of thing. Um, I don't think there's actually any proof of that at all. I mean, and Kelly it, admitted, it, he's like, yeah, I watched porn. What teenage high school boy doesn't, minus like 20%. I think it's something like 10, 20% of, the, of, of people don't at that age. You know what I mean? Like, it's really normal. Well, there is a lot more coming up in the next two episodes that we haven't revealed yet. So there's some cliffhangers out there yet. There's definitely some things that are going to be sewn up and finished up. In, in episode three, we do see Greg Kelly was out. He was out on bond. He did win his bond. And he got to go home, at least for a short time. And that's kind of where it's left off uh, in episode three. We're not sure what his fate will be. But he is out on bond. Yes. Well, yeah, because the te Texas Court of Appeals had to rule. They had to make some ruling. So that's what they're waiting on. But he was able to, to get bond. Which is Something, great. Yeah, which not everybody gets. Um, no. Right. And so he was kind of lucky at that aspect. You know, at, you know, at this point, Jack, is there anything that you want to add that you kind of want to wrap up uh, before we go? No, I think I'm going to save the, the next bit that I want to talk about into episode two. I hope everybody enjoyed our little take on it. Let us know what you thought about episodes one through three in the comments uh, or in the chat in the premiere. We're also going to go live after this premiere. And so check out that live. You are welcome to join in the live, whether in the chat or join us um, in live studio and have your say about what you thought about this documentary. Again, this is documentary club. Much like a book club, we were, we're happy to have your opinions at the forefront and we want to know what you think. What, you know, what did we get wrong? What did we get right? Did you agree with us? Did you disagree with us? As Jack has said before, we're big boys. We can handle it. So if maybe there's something that, that you want to you know, air your grievances with us or you just want to uh, come along for the ride, we really appreciate it. Again, this is, uh, you know, Showtime's documentary Outcry. We kind of covered the first, you know, three episodes. Obviously, we didn't hit every detail, but that's what the lives are for. So if you have something that we missed that you really want to get in and uh, either throw a comment down 
come to the live, chat with us, or come and join us in the studio. We would be happy to have you. That's it for us today on this one. So I am Jeff. I'm Jack. And we'll see you guys on the next one.